this is what we were asked to talk about, as Anna said, history, uh, the implications for cultural policy, uh, and the future cultural landscape. Um, I'm going to start in the present, and then I'm going to go backwards, and then I'm going to come all the way forwards to the future. Um, so the first thing I want to say, um, and I, this is the only piece of translation you're getting before anybody gets too excited uh, about anything for the Portuguese speakers, uh, and apologies if it's wrong, that was my own attempt. Um, it is the vanity of every age to consider itself in crisis. Um, if you look at the history of cultural policy in your own country, as I have done the history of cultural policy uh, in England, it is just one crisis after another, quite frankly. Um, whether that crisis is about have not having enough money or spending the money that you have in the wrong places or the wrong art forms or in the wrong ways or in cities and not in the country and so on. Cultural policy is just riven with these things. Um, but at the same time, I do think we are at a very particular moment in history where I think this crisis uh, is actually of a quite different order, uh, the ones we've seen before. Um, so I want to start with this idea uh, that cultural democracy is symptomatic of a crisis of cultural authority. We see this everywhere, not just in the cultural sphere. We see it in the discussions around expertise, uh, the kind of anti-expert agenda. We see it in fake news. We see it in criticism of any kind of professional uh, approach that embodies any kind of ideas of authority and expertise. And part of the reason for that is that those ideas of authority and expertise also come with power. And that is the problem when people are attempting to redistribute power or take it away from certain groups or to claim it for themselves, they start to critique authority. And we've seen uh, in the UK, at least, um, I've just put up these two um, reports from John Holden, um, not because they're the best ones, but just because they look good on a PowerPoint slide. Um, um, but they make quite good points. This um, cultural policy is a closed conversation among experts. Now, this... This is over 10 years old, I think. So you can see that this whole conversation has been happening for quite a long time. Um, and this calls for a democratic mandate from the public and starts to talk about participatory democracy and participatory budgets. Um, and here, the value of culture cannot be expressed only with statistics. This was when the critique of that kind of audience development, managerial approach, you know, everybody in the UK sector fell in love with the idea that they were kind of management people and like me went and did an MBA um, and we all got KPIs and smart objectives and fell in love with this whole idea that metrics were going to save us in some way but of course the problem is that the value of culture uh, cannot be expressed through statistics. Uh, and I think what's interesting is that this crisis of authority I think is quite particularly acute at an institutional level. Partly because institutions, and we're in a glorious institution right now, have this material, physical embodiment of that power, of cultural authority. Um, I would argue that many cultural institutions, if not all cultural institutions, are specifically built to show power to people who have been denied it. The people who don't participate in culture are put off by intimidating buildings that manifest that power, and that's quite deliberate. Um, there's a whole other way of looking at that, but that's just mine. Um, but I think this manifestation of power creates one of the real problems, which is, are cultural institutions part of the problem when we need to talk about cultural democracy? And of course, what we've done since the end of the Second World War is spent huge amounts of money investing in a physical infrastructure. In the 1970s, we built a lot of arts centres. We built a lot of concert halls. We built, you know, all of these different types and orders of institutional representation of particular expressions of power and authority. So I think... For people who work in the cultural sector in institutions in ways we need to think about how that power and authority is being manifested. One of the other things that we need to think about, um, 
is if we're going to challenge or at least question these ideas of cultural authority, then we can't just decide that we're going to replace it with a new position, which is, well, we've decided that now cultural, authority, cultural democracy is important. So we need to be quite reflexive as we're going forward in terms of having the debate, um, sort of acknowledging and examining the assumptions that we're making taking forward in articulating a new cultural policy position. So who gets to decide what cultural democracy means? So thankfully, I am here. That is a joke, obviously. Um, I, wouldn't be make, I wouldn't be making those uh, decisions for you unless I was being paid a lot more money, quite frankly. Um, but, so, there, there's one point. Anyway, we'll come back to this. Um, so I'm going to go backwards a little bit. Um, for me, a lot of the... Um, can you see those? A lot of the... A lot of the discourse, a lot of the conversation at policy levels, at practice levels, about cultural democracy in the present day really fails to acknowledge a very radical political history on which it was based. And Alice talked about this. It's developed over a number of decades. Okay? So you've got Owen Kelly's Manifesto for Cultural Democracy. I think that was 1986. Art with People. Um, these works, like the pedagogy of the oppressed and so on, are, are tangential but important works that articulate this. It's very important, I think, um, and I'm not going to dwell on it because we don't have time, but we can talk about it, that cultural democracy was seen as part of a much wider social and political project when it was conceived, uh, certainly in the 70s and 80s, because it was felt to be part and parcel of economic democracy and social democracy. It wasn't just something that was a conversation to take place uh, within the cultural sector. And part of this radical political history uh, presents a serious challenge to people who are working in the cultural sector today. It, cultural democracy, in terms of those writings and, and many of the others, present a really profound challenge, very explicitly, to Europe's cultural heritage. Okay? Now, I have just randomly picked some of these dead white guys here. I could have picked lots of other dead white men as well. Um, there's lots to choose from. Uh, but it's a really key point because the institution that we're in now and the institutions which many of you work in and the narratives and the histories and the policies which form the philosophy or, if you like, the ideology on which those institutions sit is fundamentally questioned by cultural democracy, okay? Just the depth of the challenge is, is a really significant issue. Um, and I want to give a particular example of this. I'm going to reference uh, a quote from this book, Artists and People, by Sue Braden. Uh, it was written in 1978. It's been out of print uh, for at least two decades, I think. Um, I think I paid like £40 for my copy or something like that, um, because that's how much of a cultural policy nerd I am. Um, anyway, so, uh, to quote Sue Braden, and this is, she's talking about these guys here, uh, some of the other ones. Uh, That's quite a bold statement to challenge the entire Enlightenment cultural history upon which all of our uh, current cultural sector is based. But there we go. So let's have a think about that. Um, I'm not knocking the Arts Council of Great Britain or its current incarnation either. Um, it's just, I use this quote, I don't necessarily agree with what she says, but I use it as a way of just giving a sense of the extent to which cultural democracy in that age, and I think it's a key question of what cultural democracy means in the present age, but in that age, in the age in which it really was written and documented and discussed, it 
considered these issues to be, uh, you know, it was, it was dealing at this scale, if you like. Now, what's important about this as well is that the Gulbenkian Foundation funded that book. Um, and the foundation said they recognised the controversial nature of community arts in advanced industrial societies and believe that community arts will be better helped if controversy is open rather than hidden, with differences freely discussed and issues identified. Now, again, this is just a talking point. I'm just going to want to throw these things out, um, and you could take them away and discuss them with colleagues and so on. But there is a question here about whether we're truly having a conversation about cultural democracy and what it means, or whether the institutions and the vested power and authority in our organisations simply want to take this seemingly nice idea and roll it into the way uh, that they already exist, to kind of neuter it, if you like. Um, so I'm just going to close just by some comments on cultural democracy future. So, Rebecca Blackman, where are you? <laughs> Um, here's the Arts Council's draft 10-year uh, strategy. Now, this is not a quote about cultural democracy, but I just want to give you an example of, I think, where we are in policy terms. The document says, by 2030, we anticipate where we will investigate in organisations and people that differ in many cases from those that we support today. Okay? Now, you could read that as saying, we are going to adopt quite a radical different approach to how we understand cultural policy, and that will result in us changing quite considerably the portfolio of clients that we have. Or you could read it as saying, organisations come and go, people die, someone's going to get run over by a bus at some point, um, there's bound to be change. Huh, change, OK? Um, so, you know, these things... Um, I mean, uh, cultural democracy doesn't appear in the, in the, as a term in the strategy, but once you begin a debate about dismantling and disrupting the power structures and the policy structures that exist, you can start to see these things appearing um, in different places. Now, just to go back to institutions very briefly, one of the... Uh, this is the Royal Opera House in London, Covent Garden... Um, one of the challenges with effecting any kind of change in the cultural sector, and where specifically when we talk about power, is the hidden power within these organisations, the vested interest and the political leverage and connections that organisations and great cultural institutions have. Um, there is an apocryphal story that whenever the Arts Council is considering cutting the budget for the Royal Opera House, the phone starts ringing in number 11 Downing Street because a member of the board has phoned up to complain about it. Um, so we're not just talking innocently about policy change. You know, We can't just sit here and say, we should have a more democratic approach, we should reconsider cultural value. Let's change it and let's have a culturally democratic approach because there are whole material considerations about power and authority that we can't even see that are vested in that infrastructure, which will resist change. Um, and I think there is an argument that says, and I'm not interested in knocking the Royal Opera House. One of my best friends is the director of opera at the Royal Opera House. But um, one of the things is that the interests of cultural institutions like the Royal Opera House are not the same interests of the furthering the cultural sector. They are different things. What is good for the Royal Opera House, in my opinion, is not good for the cultural sector in many ways. So again, when we talk about this idea of democracy in relation to cultural policy, we've got some big issues to address. Um, so I'm just going to give you a list uh, of some of these. As we talked about there, if, if cultural democracy were adopted as a much broader, more impactful policy approach, would we see a rebalancing of funding portfolios? In a zero-sum scenario, that would mean taking money away from some of the established institutions to redirect it. There's no magic money tree creating money to come into this to broaden the scope of things. We have a new centre for cultural value um, in Leeds in the UK, specifically designed to address these questions of how do we value culture. And this is what cultural democracy, for me, um, is really about who gets to decide what has value, who gets to put those different values in a hierarchy, 
Who gets to decide what's valuable for me and valuable for you? This debate, I mean, has been happening for a long time. Really important to note that if you look at the history of cultural democracy, it's a culture of failure. I like to kind of say cultural democracy is a lot like communism or socialism. It's a really lovely idea that never happened. Um, because it is a history of failure in terms of its failure to gain traction. Um, the way that the community arts movement, I think, was quite co-opted uh, by the, the wider arts sector. Um, and then to overtly institutional expressions of power. That's slightly wordy, but I think what I'm kind of saying there is we've already started to see a move towards national theatre companies that don't have buildings, um, companies that do site-specific performance and don't have venues and so on. You can read that as a way of going, actually, we're moving away from this institutional idea of power. Um, but as I said earlier, we've invested so much in that institutional infrastructure, that's a real problem. Um, and I put this in... Um, intersectional uh, theory is, is very popular uh, and has been for some time within kind of uh, academic circles. Um, and I've just put this in partly to say that, to go back to that history of cultural democracy, um, in, a, in a very overly reductive way, if you look at things in an intersectional way, you are taking all of the different political, social and economic factors that are impacting on a certain situation. Um, and I suspect that in two or three years' time, we will be back somewhere talking about intersectional cultural policy and the need to recognise all of the different variances uh, that are impacting on how we think about funding for the arts. Um, but that's just the list. I'm not going to go into it in any more detail because I just want to talk very briefly uh, about you lot and this idea of an emotional attachment to our labour. Um, and this is something that resonates with me uh, quite a lot as well. So the cultural sector as a vocation offers prestige and self-fulfillment in place of material reward and requires a strong personal commitment which can be subjectively experienced as selflessness and passion. <laughs> Just in case you're confused by the language, material reward means money, uh, obviously, <laughs> and not having any. Um, now, I think, again, this is part of the process of being reflective and reflexive about challenging ourselves and each other and institutions and policy frameworks um, about whether we are uh, indeed the baddies in this situation. Um, this is a, if you don't know this, this is a comedy, famous comedy sketch where they're wearing Nazi uniforms in the war and they suddenly think, are we the baddies um, in this? Because there is a sense in which if you work, in the, if you work to promote the democratisation of culture in high art and, and elitism and so on, uh, people who uh, propose cultural democracy might indeed see you as the baddies. So I'm going to close with a quote uh, from, Mark F Woo, from Mark Fisher. Um, and what I want to suggest to you is we can take this term emancipatory politics here and substitute the term cultural democracy. This isn't about cultural policy, by the way, but I just think it really resonates with me, so I just use it in every presentation, even if I just have to crowbar it in right at the end. Um, but that's the challenge. I think this is the challenge of cultural democracy, um, to take what is presented as inevitable as being a mere contingency. Um, so that's everything for me. Thank you very much. Thank you.